Good morning to everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Life is busy and we appreciate you taking time to hear from our team this morning. We're very excited to present outcomes from a study that was done to assess the potential for high quality carbon offsets in the Great Lakes region. How much capacity is there in gigatons? What is the market value of that capacity? My name is Susan Fancy, and I'm the Associate Director for the Global CO2 Initiative at the University of Michigan. At the request of the Conference of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers this spring, I assembled a student team that worked over the summer to tackle these questions. And today we will hear details on what was learned. Next slide, please. But before we get into that material, we will hear a welcome from David Nafsker from the Conference of the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers. And we will also hear from Volker Sick from the Global CO2 Initiative. So take it away, David. Next slide, please. Thank you, Susan. And uh, believe me, you're not the first to struggle with the name of our organization. <laughs> The conference is a partnership of the governors from the eight Great Lakes states and the premiers from Ontario and Quebec. Through the conference, they work together to protect our regional environment and grow our regional economy. As a part of our work, we launched with a number of partners, including the University of Michigan, the Great Lakes Impact Investment Platform. And the focus of the platform is to attract more impact investment. That is investment that is focused around seeking a financial return as well as a positive environmental outcome for the region. In recent years, carbon has become an increasing focus and research has mostly focused around particular products or industries or particular sequestration strategies. And what was really missing was a, a look at what is the particular opportunity for our region from the growth of the global carbon offset markets. And we were really pleased to engage with the University of Michigan Global CO2 Initiative to create just that. It helps to position our region to better understand the trends in the global marketplace, looking at our regional economy and our particular assets that make us well positioned to capitalize on particular parts of the market, and a series of recommended actions that we can take a look at to turn this analysis into action. Really pleased to have such a talented group of partners to work with. I would like to thank Susan, Jacqueline Taylor, Morgan Cobb, all of the others who were involved in the creation of this report. I'd also like to thank John Allen for his counsel uh, throughout all of our work. Really look forward to hearing from the students and from the rest of the team today. And I thank everyone for joining us. Uh, it will take all of us working together to take best advantage of this terrific opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And Volker. I'm between this brief uh, welcome and recognition of, uh, of this fantastic work and you actually hearing about what Susan and the student team have accomplished. At the Global CO2 Initiative, we really believe that the solution to the CO2 problem actually resides within CO2 in capturing and utilizing it so that it becomes a, a mainstream carbon management solution that provides us with multiple opportunities to take advantage of that CO2. First of all, of course, we do know we need to remove a lot of CO2 that resides in the atmosphere and in the water. And we also know that there's a continuing need for carbon-based products. Life around us is carbon-based and we cannot change that but we can change the way we actually produce the products that we make and that uh, we use, and CO2 can become a carbon source. That way we create additional value, and how we actually do this is very nicely exemplified with the work that you're gonna be hearing about. To provide the intellectual leadership that um, we do not only build by educating students, but as you will see and hear today, we educate our students by having them drive new insights that have immediate impact. This is an exciting way of learning. This is an exciting way of producing value to society. And this is really what we hope to do. We need to accelerate the way we think about CO2 capture and utilization. And 
I couldn't be happier with how the summer project went. And I'm thrilled that you're all with us today to hear about what the students have found. So back to Susan. Okay, so as David explained, our problem statement for the summer was to look at the potential in the region for carbon offsets that could be sold into the voluntary carbon markets. The first question is, what's happened historically? What is the back cast of deals? What types of carbon offsets have been created? What are the price points? And what then is possible going forward? How many gigatons of CO2? What is the dollar value of that tonnage? And what are some recommendations on how to make our region a go-to area for high quality carbon offsets? Next slide, please. But before I dive into the summer work, for context, I would like to provide a brief overview of global markets for carbon utilized products. We did a market study in 2016. We updated it in 2022 at the Global CO2 Initiative. And what you're looking at on this slide is a little different in the summer's work in that this includes products that are not suitable for carbon offsets, such as fuels and chemicals. But the context is helpful. As Volker said, many everyday products contain carbon and fossil carbon is both used as an energy source to make those products, but also often used as a feedstock for these products. So think plastics, synthetic fabrics, fertilizers, chemicals, and so on in the feedstock category for what we buy today. In order to wean ourselves off of fossil carbon as a feedstock, we have three choices in the future to replace it. Recycled carbon from used goods, uh, the usage of plant carbon, either land-based or from the sea, or captured carbon from the atmosphere and our industrial smokestack. And our global market study looked at products from this last category, the captured carbon dioxide. And what you see is that we concluded that the annual potential in 2050 is an annual utilization of two to 27 gigatons of CO2 with a market value of 1.1 to 4.4 trillion dollars. So this is an exciting conclusion and will help humanity go a very long way to defossilize or manufacture goods in support of a circular carbon economy, as well as using CO2 as a new ingredient as a climate mitigation tool. So with that as an introduction, I'd like to hand it off to Jacqueline, our public policy student from the summer's team, who will get us going on the work they did on the Great Lakes markets. Yeah, thanks, Susan, and hi, everyone. This slide right here is our methodological approach, so I'll just breeze over it for everyone just so you can get a better idea of how we approached our work this summer. We thought it was really essential that we focus both on quantitative and qualitative approaches in our research as this field is growing rapidly, scientifically and socially. So we needed experts from both sides of the aisle. And then we also wanted to list off our goals for you. So we categorized and described demand side voluntary carbon market and market drivers. Ideally, high quality additional carbon storage options would be identified that also supported the economy, wanted to create first order estimates of supply side carbon storage potential and those associated revenues, describe historical carbon offset transactions, describe criteria for those high quality carbon offsets, and then find non-published pathways to connect with current activities on the supply side and demand side. And I feel good about saying that we did most of these things and we accomplished them to our full capacity and we had a lot of fun doing so this summer. Our team looked at a wide variety of nature-based and engineered projects with the potential to generate new supplies of carbon offsets that can be sold. So this is just an overview of what we did this summer. Next slide, please. So this slide summarizes the sources we use to get that information. We used many of the latest reports to ground the team in recent qualitative data. This was essential in the beginning of our project to get everyone on the same page and get those general words and terms memorized so that we were able to dive into deeper research for our specific region. We then referred to GIS-based maps that displayed regional potential for carbon storage and forests underground, as well as emission sources and other geographical information. And then we made our own. 
that filled gaps of knowledge and combined all of our findings, which Morgan will share with all of you later. We also conducted interviews with stakeholders in this field. We did this under Chatham House rules, so everyone felt free to talk and be honest and have the most effective and valuable conversations possible. In these interviews, we spoke to a number of Fortune 500 companies and got information about both demand and supply side, talked to large carbon offset project developers, top managers in state forestry departments and nature-focused NGOs, researchers in universities and government laboratories, to name just a few. And without the variety of expertise and opinions in our interviewing process, we would not have been able to accomplish the breadth and depth of work we did. So to all of our interviewees who helped contribute to our our report and are here today, thank you so much. We truly appreciate you. Next slide. We love this graphic. We think this graphic outlines our work well. It's from the ecosystem marketplace. They're a well-established outlet that observes market conditions for carbon offset markets. They distribute annual surveys to project developers, retailers, investors, and others to collect information so that pricing of carbon offsets is as transparent as possible, which we love because <laughs> there's a lacking of transparency in this marketplace today. As you can see in the graphic, the ecosystem marketplace has identified 170 different types of carbon credits in several categories, to name a few, renewable energy, household and community sources, energy efficiency, waste and disposal, agriculture, the list goes on and on. It's really fun if you have time to ever go on their website or just browse through. It's really interesting to see all the different types of carbon credits. But for the purpose of this report, we will focus on just a small number of these potential project types that can be sold into the carbon markets with a focus on high quality carbon removal and storage. Unfortunately, lots of carbon credits and offsets are about removing carbon that would have been removed without us creating a market. So we really wanted to focus on carbon credits and offsets that remove additional carbon from the atmosphere, which we also will touch on later. But something that would be a brief example would be like a tree. A tree will absorb carbon dioxide, whether you and I created a market for it or not. But if we planted more trees, that were not already existing, and then they began absorbing CO2, that would be an additional forestry credit, just for an example. Next slide, please. Another awesome graphic that we've referred to a lot in our research, this graphic is an overview of strategies that an organization or corporation could employ to reach their net zero goals. We see a lot of those everywhere on labels. We're going to be net zero by 2050, but how are we going to do it? So by definition, achieving net zero emissions requires that any emissions that are not reduced must be removed. An appropriate order to address emissions reduction is shown in the graphic. So reduction, avoidance, and then removal. And I can kind of explain each one just so we're clear on what those look like. Reduced emissions are existing emissions that no longer occur. So functionally, this task involves emitting fewer emissions in the first place. Energy efficiency, efficiency measures, energy conservation are all great examples of this. Next, avoided emissions. These are ones that might have occurred but do not. Examples of this would be walking or biking to work instead of driving or installing wind turbines instead of natural gas power generation. And lastly, the one that everyone wants to utilize but should be utilized lastly is Removed carbon, uh, this is removing legacy emissions that were previously emitted and subsequently retrieved. Examples of this would be natural processes such as mineral weathering or managed ecosystems such as reforestation or engineered solutions. And we'll talk about some of these today. Next slide, please. All right, so this is what we came up with as criteria for what a quality carbon offset would look like. This is a hot button topic in the community right now. And from a summary of interviews we conducted, the published methodologies such as the Oxford carbon offsetting principles and criteria from companies, and then also carbon registries such as Vera, Gold Standard, and the American Carbon Registry, this is what we came up with. So firstly, projects should be centered around carbon removal. 
as much as possible, they should be a carbon negative process through a life cycle assessment. Secondly, additionality is key. Like my example about trees, all carbon being removed should be additional carbon that wouldn't have been removed otherwise. Three seems like a no-brainer, no double counting with offsets, but it's actually one that we really struggled with. There's no one place where all credits and offsets are being managed right now. They're kind of scattered amongst several sources, like the ones I just listed. So we're seeing this huge issue with double counting and offset. Next, carbon offset projects should go through monitoring, reporting, and verification processes through independent third-party audits just to determine they're legitimate and the removal potential has a specific time frame and that time frame is managed. Next, the project should prioritize high durability, meaning that it prioritizes long-term carbon storage with a low risk of reversibility and re-emission of carbon back into the atmosphere. And then lastly, the project should ensure environmental justice um, by involving community input and transparency in all stages of the decision-making process. Next slide, please. Here is a backcast of historical voluntary carbon offset deals in the Great Lakes region. According to the Berkeley Carbon Trading Project and Carbon Direct Database, carbon credit issuances and retirements in the Great Lakes region have been increasing since 2006, following global trends. Issuances reached a maximum of 10.5 million tons or 0.11 gigatons in 2019, which is 7.6% of global issuances and retirements, and retirements were around roughly 13 million tons in 2020 or 0.13 gigatons. Chemical processes are the most common type of carbon credit, followed by agriculture and forestry. And then less than 3% of global carbon offset projects were indicated as being high quality in the database, with even less in the Great Lakes region, which is really upsetting. And the issue is that credits are emissions reductions instead of actual carbon dioxide removal processes. McKinsey estimates that annual global demand for carbon credits could reach up to 1.5 to 2 gigatons of carbon dioxide by 2030 and up to 7 to 13 gigatons of CO2 by 2050. And this is something a lot of climate scientists are pondering. Where will these credits come from and how can we ensure they're legitimate? So definitely an important topic and something we'll have to develop a more secure system for over time. Next slide, please. So this bar chart shows the types of credit issuances. Chemical processes, like I mentioned, are the major source of carbon credits followed by agriculture and forestry. Chemical processes is kind of a confusing term. So within that, there's ozone depleting substance recovery, HFC replacement and foam production. And those are just to name a few, but they're definitely a little more technical than some of the agricultural or forestry solutions. Very few projects, like I mentioned, were indicated as being high quality in our databases we found. So it's important that we keep an eye on this. And I think that is all I have. So I will hand it off to Morgan, um, an engineering student who I worked with this summer. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Now I will provide an overview of the Nature Basin Engineered Solutions available in the Great Lakes region. On the right side of this diagram, we have an overview of nature-based carbon capture. This involves methods involving soil carbon sequestration, as well as afforestation, reforestation, and improved forest management by reforesting land and improving management practices on both agricultural and forest lands. We can increase the potential to sequester CO2. Additionally, there's opportunity for other plant-based carbon capture in plant mass, not in forest or agricultural systems, including coastal ecosystems. Our region has a lot of coastlines that can be maximized for carbon sequestration potential, as well as wetlands. And on the far right, we have biological ocean and freshwater sequestration in the Great Lakes region, as well as the oceans in general. This involves macroscopic aquatic organisms that can photosynthesize and sequester CO2, as well as microorganisms that sequester CO2. Moving to the left side, we have engineered carbon capture. So this can be done through several different methods. One of these is point source carbon capture. So in an industrial setting, this can capture emissions from cement and steel and other processes to produce a gaseous CO2 stream. We would attach a filter to an effluent gas stream to capture CO2 at high concentrations. 
Similarly, we can also capture CO2 directly from the atmosphere. In direct air captures here, the concentrations are much lower, only 400 parts per million. This is a bit more of an energy intensive process, but the end product is the same, which is a gaseous CO2 product. Additionally, there's ocean and freshwater carbon removal through engineered solutions involving both electrolysis and alkalinity enhancement. And depending on the process, we can be left with a mineralized CO2 product or a gaseous CO2 stream. All of these processes result in captured CO2, which can either be utilized or stored underground. On the geologic storage side, we have three different kinds of formations that have the potential to store CO2. So there's deep saline aquifers, which are essentially brine formations, and we have unmineable coal as well as depleted oil and gas reservoirs. On the utilization side, Susan already went over a lot of these sectors as well as the global market potential for those. But just to reiterate, we have construction materials, chemicals, as well as polymers and new materials. And something that was not mentioned previously is carbon black products, which is essentially a fine powder made of elemental carbon, which can be used to reinforce rubber, as well as different insulative and conductive coatings, depending on the property of the carbon black itself. Something important to note is on the nature-based side, sometimes we have waste biomass from forestry practices or agricultural settings, and that waste biomass can then be combusted for bioenergy in a process familiarly known as bioenergy carbon capture and storage, or BECS is the common acronym for that. So we can produce biomass as well as point source capture those emissions from that combustion. And one of the really interesting byproducts of that reaction is called biochar, which is essentially a charcoal of the biomass with a high carbon content. And that can be applied to both soil in agricultural settings, as well as forestry settings to increase the water retention and further increase the ability of that land to sequester CO2. This next slide is an overall ecosystem of how engineered solutions fit into a larger industrial setting. One of the important things that was not shown on the previous slide is a prerequisite for these processes, which is low carbon energy. Direct ocean capture, direct air capture, as well as point source carbon capture should ideally be co-located with low carbon energy sources to increase the carbon negativity of this process, whether that's geothermal, nuclear, solar, or wind power. Something that's really interesting for point source carbon capture is the ability to capitalize off of waste heat, especially in processes that use a lot of heat like cement and steel manufacturing. We can utilize the waste heat of these processes and also store that CO2 underground. Moving on, we have Richard Greeley at the University of Michigan created a GIS map overview for us. So he created a dashboard which goes over a lot of CO2 sources in the region as well as a graphical representation that is interactive. Um, and so we'll be releasing this with the report and you can click on individual points and learn more information about each of them. I will stop sharing my screen and do a quick demonstration of that mapping resource. This is the map resource that will be released with the report. When you first open the map, this is what the dashboard looks like. It gives different statistics about projects in the region, including capture sites, field projects, as well as CO2 sources in the region. On this main map, we can click on different points and view individual data about each individual point. There's pre-selected map formation, so we have CO2 sources as well as the transport of CO2 for a more graphical approach. And these maps I've pre-selected, but all of the layers are available on the map resource. We have the transportation of CO2, which involves crude oil pipelines and other hydrocarbon pipelines in the region. So we included this source on the map because we can actually piggyback off of existing infrastructure by utilizing the same easements or actually repurposing some of the existing pipelines for the transportation of CO2. So that's why we included all of these pipelines in the map. Additionally, we have we mapped the potential for solid waste biomass according to data from the National Renewable Energy Technology Laboratory. We also have data from the Nature Conservancy detailing carbon capture by reforestation on a county by county level in the region. Additionally, one of the most exciting opportunities in the region and by far that presents the greatest potential for CO2 storage is that of geologic formation. So this data was pulled from the NatCarb database from the Department of Energy, and this maps unmineable coal formations, saline formations, and sedimentary basins, which involve all three of the basins that I previously mentioned, including unmineable coal, saline formations, and depleted oil and gas reservoirs. As you can see, the subsurface area of this region is almost completely covered by these formations. And so there's a really unique opportunity for this region to collaborate together to store CO2 underground, especially in these formations that cross state borders. 
the Department of Energy gave both a low and high estimate for these values. So the low estimate is about 140 gigatons of CO2 of storage potential, and the upper estimate is 510 gigatons of CO2. And so that was a really quick overview of this map, and we're really excited to release that with the report. And now I will go back to the presentation really quickly. Based on these data sources, we were able to capture the total market potential from 2022 to 2050. The scope of this project did not allow us to assess the feasibility of these revenue productions, and we didn't really assess the costs or the capital investments in this projection either. We were just mostly focused on framing the market potential, and that's kind of the only thing that the scope of this project allowed us to do. We were able to quantify this for reforestation, building materials, and geologic storage. So on the reforestation side, we quantified that for both public and private lands. So for public lands, those are owned by the state governments and they are already very well managed to capture CO2. So that's why the incremental potential for storage is not very great. The total revenue is about just under 1 billion US dollars for the total potential from 2022 to 2050. Private lands, the opportunity here is much greater. So we gave both a lower and an upper range. And because of one of the challenges on private lands is aggregating smaller landowners and convincing them to reforest their land and improve forest management. And so we assumed um, a lower bound of 10% of the total storage potential detailed by the Nature Conservancy. And the public land figure assumes that the full potential is realized as given by the Nature Conservancy projected from 2022 to 2050. And that's due to the good management of the lands by public utilities. We were also able to quantify aggregates for construction and concrete. The lower and upper bounds of this are dependent on the individual error in capturing CO2. We have different estimates for the total amount of CO2 that can be sequestered per ton of building material that dictates the lower and upper bounds. And for both precast concrete and aggregates, we assume that 10% of the incumbent market by 2050 would be captured and converted to carbonated aggregates. That's also where those lower and upper bounds come from. On the geologic storage side of things, the NatCarb database gave both a low and high estimate for the total storage potential. And so that ranged from 140 to 510 gigatons of CO2 potential. And for the purposes of this study, we assumed that 10% of both those values would be realized by 2050. For maximizing the ability of carbon capture, we can both perform this in centralized hubs as well as decentralized approaches. One of the really interesting opportunities in this region is the ability for centralized hubs. So the Great Plains Institute assessed carbon and hydrogen hubs in the near future in the entire United States. And our region actually exhibits three of those 11 hubs that they assessed. These hubs are based upon ideal industrial emission sources, as well as transportation infrastructure and geologic storage potential, as well as utilization potential in the near future. So the Marquis complex is something that is currently being constructed by the Marquis companies. They already have permits for geologic storage, but essentially they have the ideal qualifications for both capturing CO2 and storing it underground. So they are close to a lot of transportation infrastructure for geologic storage, as well as transporting those products on highways. And they are co-located with a lot of industrial processes that allow for point source carbon capture of CO2. So that is something in the region that is being pushed forward right now and very exciting potential. We also have decentralized examples in both building materials as well as biotar. On the building materials side of things, we have decentralized carbon capture units. So a Japanese company called Mitsubishi is developing point source carbon capture systems for both capturing CO2 on site and creating carbonated building materials on site as well. And this is a approach that favors a more decentralized approach due to the bulkiness of the curated materials. And so it makes more sense to capture that CO2 more locally, as well as distribute it locally. And something else that favors a more decentralized approach is biomass and bioenergy. So it makes sense to locally process that waste biomass, as well as distribute the resulting biochar and bioenergy to increase, to actually make that process carbon negative. And that is something that can be done more locally, co-located with those sources of waste biomass. Next, we'll provide some strengths and weaknesses of both nature-based carbon offsets. It's important to note that we definitely need each of these solutions to work together in tandem to meet our carbon reduction goals. Each of them have their own individual strengths. Something that's really great about nature-based solutions is that they are plentiful and they are already currently being implemented in a lot of cases. So 
These can be implemented in the near future while engineered solutions are being scaled up. There are a lot of co-benefits associated with nature-based solutions, such as biodiversity, recreation spaces, cleaner water and atmosphere, improved air quality. There are options available in every region and something really great about our region is that we are well insulated against the effects of climate change due to the Great Lakes. And according to EPA data sources that project the impacts on ecosystems from increased temperatures, the Great Lakes is relatively insulated. So a lot of these nature-based solutions will be resilient over time, especially to wildfires and invasive species. Additionally, these solutions are inexpensive and easy to market and sell. A lot of them are currently being traded on the markets. Some weaknesses of these approaches, however, it's very difficult to measure the actual carbon stored. So a lot of these are more estimates. It's hard to verify the actual carbon storage over the project lifetime. They are susceptible to invasive species and wildfires. Um, however, like I mentioned, the Great Lakes region is a bit more resilient as compared to other regions in the United States. A lot of these sources sequester carbon on more of a short term. The turnaround time is a lot less, especially for something like a tree that could be used in different products or sometimes logged or combusted, as opposed to something like geologic storage, which sequesters things on effectively geologic timescales. Additionally, a huge concern is land use for a lot of the nature-based solutions, especially given that a lot of these private lands are owned by an older population, convincing them to sign up their land for 100-year contracts for a lot of these forestry timelines is something that's very difficult, especially considering competing land uses such as increased housing for um, increased population as well as food production. These are important considerations that should be taken when making nature-based projects. On the engineered carbon side, there are many strengths which include the ability to accurately verify how much carbon was actually sequestered. So that's one of the huge strengths of engineered carbon capture. It's very easy to model and verify how much carbon is actually being removed. Additionally, there are many gigatons of potential of storage in the region. Something that's also very exciting is, and that Jacqueline will get into later is tax credits for sequestering CO2. Additionally, with the creation of carbon storage pathways, we can also utilize that carbon and create new jobs along with the creation of new products. And additionally, with pivoting carbon storage, we can translate a lot of existing oil and gas jobs to geologic storage jobs. Um, some of the weaknesses of this approach are that a lot of the technology is not yet developed and it's expensive to run some of these processes, especially direct air capture, since the concentrations are so low compared to point source capture. So capitalizing off of low carbon energy in areas that exhibit a lot of potential for that will be crucial in driving down cost, um, as well as capitalizing off of waste heat processes in an industrial setting for point source carbon capture. One of the weaknesses of that is that it creates an additional demand for low carbon energy. And some of these sources as well can be seen as extending the lifetime of fossil fuels for point source carbon capture projects. That's why we definitely recommend first avoiding and reducing emissions before using removal as a last step. But it's important to do everything possible to avoid global warming. And these solutions need to be put together in tandem to maximize that environmental benefit. And I'll hand it off to Jacqueline. Yeah, so just like Morgan mentioned, this is one of the tax credits, the 45Q tax credit that has been updated as the Inflation Reduction Act this past summer in August, which I'm sure many of you are just as excited as I am. <laughs> um, the bill offers $369 billion USD for climate action through tax credits and other initiatives, which is the largest and most historic piece of energy legislation in U.S. history. And then I'll just run you through quickly what this looks like and what this update looks like. So 45Q offers a baseline of pricing for $12 per ton of carbon utilization and $17 per ton for carbon sequestration. But if the 45Q qualified facility meets specific wage, hour, and apprenticeship requirements, the credit can be multiplied by five. Once multiplied by five, the carbon utilization tax credit is $60 per ton, and the carbon sequestration tax credit is $85 per ton. Similar regulations apply to direct air capture facilities. The carbon utilization tax credit is $26 per ton, and the carbon sequestration tax credit is $130 per ton. 
if the 45Q qualified facility meets specific wage, hour, and apprenticeship requirements, then the DAC utilization tax credit increases to $130 and $180 per ton. So pretty significant tax credit jumps from what they were previously and also very incentivizing, but we need to educate the public on how they're able to access those. Next slide, please. These are some regional barriers to voluntary carbon markets. As I just mentioned, general awareness of stakeholders and just um, the U.S. population and global population on rhetoric surrounding climate change, carbon capture, all these technologies is really minimal and very confusing. Everyone defines these things differently. Um, and I have a feeling it all stems from the fact that our marketplace does not have distinct pricing and lines in which carbon offsets should function, which makes it a little more complicated, certainly. Next, lack of planning and coordination amongst emission sources and sinks, the lack of profitability for a new supply side carbon solutions, and then the lack of supporting infrastructure. There is definitely a brief window of time where technology and storage, storage solutions would need to invest into generating sizable profits. So that would look like new pipelines or infrastructure, but we are able to use a lot of infrastructure we already have for higher emitting technologies such as class six wells. Next slide, please. These are some policy recommendations and just general recommendations that my team and I came up with. Firstly, U.S. states with significant geologic potential to store CO2 in Class 6 wells should submit a primacy application to the U.S. EPA. There are only a couple states that have it right now, such as North Dakota and Wyoming, and there are a lot of states waiting, but because the EPA doesn't have a ton of bandwidth to get these primacy applications approved, it's essential that all states that have geologic potential submit this application as soon as possible. Secondly, state and provincial agencies should coordinate with hard to abate industries, industries like iron, steel, cement, even like aviation companies should really work to abate their emissions as their sector is harder to find sustainable aviation fuels or sustainable ways to make cement. At least abating these emitting industries would be a good start in the right direction and hold us over until we're able to have better technology to do these in a more environmentally conscious way. Next, the Great Lakes region should hold 45Q tax credit carbon emission reduction and carbon offset seminars to inform regional companies and individuals of the opportunities for carbon storage and utilization to facilitate collaboration amongst the states and two Canadian provinces. Next slide, please. These are our recommendations continued, just our last two. So our fourth one is probably the one that would require the most coordination amongst the region. So the Great Lakes St. Lawrence region should create a program similar to Quebec's cap and trade system or the regional greenhouse gas initiative known as Reggie, if any of you are familiar, to establish a regulated carbon market for those states and regions to work under and work under that carbon budget, which would be determined by a climate scientist for that region. And lastly, the Great Lakes St. Lawrence region should develop and support a sovereign wealth fund. Sovereign wealth funds are one of the most, I think, personally underestimated uh, ways to create environmentally just action and also to sequester and CO2 and also help uh, environments. So Owners and operations of Class 6 wells, direct air capture firms, or other waste biomass collectors used for CCU could contribute 1% to 2% of their wealth to this fund. An example of this is Norway's Sovereign Wealth Fund, which was started in 1990 and has held assets of $1.4 trillion or approximately $250,000 per resident as of December of 2021. This is kind of our inspiration for this suggestion. And in the Great Lakes region, a sovereign wealth fund could also be used in part to backstop future liabilities arising from CCU activities to encourage companies to invest in building out carbon storage and carbon utilization activities. And these sovereign wealth funds can be used for a wide array of tasks and benefits for the region and its residents. Thanks.
Thank you very much, Jacqueline. So along the way this summer, we noted as we went that there are a number of areas that would be worthy of follow-up study. Those include what it would take to deploy the carbonated aggregates and precast concrete production as new commercial industries in each state and province. As we saw, there's tremendous potential for durable carbon storage, which would make very valuable uh, sales into the voluntary carbon markets and also generate local jobs and revenue. Another item identified was launching a study to decarbonize, really reduce the CO2 levels of the Great Lakes water bodies. Is there a way to safely and sustainably remove CO2 from the Great Lakes over the long term, again, with then offsets that could be sold into the markets? Another item was to look at a study on where future direct air capture plants should be located. Hopefully by 2050, we are only collecting emissions from those hard to abate sectors such as concrete. And what we would be needing then at that point in time are direct air capture plants to reduce legacy emissions and to help balance out the emitters that are still needed. Where should those be located? Near CCS sites where there's renewables and also carbon utilization producers. What is the best usage for waste biomass in the region? We identified that there'd be 2.4 gigatons of biomass available between now and 2050. We weren't able to figure out what the best usage for that is. Should it be used to make fuels? Should it be used to make biochar, energy? What are the options for that? A regional forest carbon strategy would be helpful to identify. What is the best way on both private and public lands for those to deliver both ecosystem services and support economic goals, including additional revenue into the region from the sales of voluntary carbon offsets in the markets. There is potential for additional geologic storage in the region that we weren't able to get to in basaltic, um, peridotite or other formations. We also didn't get to look at detail for the depleted oil and gas wells. So what, what would that look like as incremental storage? And this next one's a little bit more complicated, but it's really not clear. One of the people we interviewed said that, you know, carbon capture systems on utilities, they are needed as a bridging strategy, of course. I mean, we're at what, 6% global renewables right now. We need our fossil plants as we uh, build out clean generation over time. What is the feasibility of operator cost recovery for carbon capture systems, both in the rate base and also with the regional grid operators like MISO, for example, which dispatch power on the least expensive cost. So that could disadvantage a plant that has carbon capture installed. Are there mechanisms beyond grants to get that done? And then, of course, last but not least, as Morgan mentioned, our study today looked at what are the potential markets? We did not look at the capital that would be required or the human infrastructure and other infrastructure that would be needed to deliver those markets. That's a separate question and a very important one. Next slide, please. So we were very really excited that um, of what we found. We identified from 2022 to 2050, a total of 14 and a half to 52 gigatons of high quality carbon storage available in the Great Lakes region that can be sold into the carbon markets. What we're especially excited about is that that carbon storage can balance annual regional emissions, which today are one and a half gigatons with extra to sell. And of course, we anticipate year over year going forward that those emissions will come down. And we felt that our estimates were conservative. We, we thought they were balanced. So we were excited about this. And we loved what one of the people we interviewed said about the Great Lakes region. Uh, we had the quote on a couple of slides previous, but the Great Lakes has a lot of diversity, a lot of shipping, a lot of industry, universities, lumber, cars, and a high population density that will grow over time. And it's an area of the world that is uniquely free of climate disasters, wildfires, floods, mudslides, and so it will be a promising economic zone there is no clear leader in the Great Lakes region, and it makes sense to plan due to the natural resources and industry. So we concluded that our region has an opportunity to lead the world in carbon capture and storage and carbon capture and utilization in products, revenue, and employment, and, and be a prototype for the rest of the world. And so we were 
really excited that the Conference of Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors Premiers asked us to do this study, and we were happy with what came out of it. So at this point, we can go off slide share and welcome any questions from the audience. I see one from Jordan. He says, Michigan is home to one of the greatest magnesium salt reservoirs. Yeah, and then the UP has ultramific basalt resources. Has the potential to move this? Yeah, so yeah, they can be moved. No, we have we did not address that, Jordan. There it was a short 11 week study, and that's a really, really great question, what you're asking. So we can put that on our list of things to follow up on. Storage exploitation may also be limited by investor reluctance in the face of financial risk. That's true. And so one of the things that, that we 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 liked about the idea of a sovereign wealth fund is not only could it be used to set aside resources that could be used to fund clean energy projects um, and other things that would have benefit to society, it could also be used as a hedge to balance out the liability for engaging in CCS or engaging in CCU activities and help incentivize companies to invest in the area. How can we join with you to make your recommendation, recommendations a reality and work together on follow-up study? We are doing equivalent R&D to you in Canada. We will put our my contact information in the chat. Reach out to us and we can have a conversation with you and Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers to work further on these questions. Bob Manns commented from Core Energy, has commented, do not en- underestimate the role of project profitability for new supply of carbon solutions. Yeah, 45Q is not adequate to make a project economically viable. Yes, he's absolutely right about that. We are at the very beginning of this industry, and right now, most of those engineered solutions that we talked about, are it's just the first projects coming online. They are not economically viable. So we need support. We need investment for those to scale. What we'd like to see happen is that this field follow the path of solar. Today, solar energy is 99% cheaper than it was 30 years ago, and that's without even taking into account inflation. That's what we need to have happen in order to deliver the benefits that we're talking about today. And we think it can happen. How big are you envisioning the sovereign wealth fund needing to be? And what sector would you tax to generate the revenue? Because that's a great question, Bob. Again, I think this needs more study. But what we noticed in Norway is they, in 1990, they started setting aside, I don't know, one or 2% of revenues from oil and gas. And at this point, so that was 1990. At this point, that wealth fund in 2022 is worth $240,000 per resident. It's a huge number. So our thinking was set aside money from anyone doing, C- you know, carving the geologic storage, CCS into class six wells, probably direct air capture. There's some sense of public ownership of that, of, of those spaces somehow. And go from there. You know, definitely a good a good conversation starter for sure. So I also just want to take a quick moment, uh, we'll see if any more questions come in, to uh, put a plug in for our fantastic students. Um, both Jacqueline and Morgan will be graduating in the spring, so um, they'll be looking for a job and they're trained in this field. Reach out if you think you would like to hire them. What else do we have here? Yeah, so again, we've got a comment here. We do need a robust carbon offset market to bridge economic gap to enable projects to be developed. In addition to helping coordinate, you know, the role that the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers hopefully will undertake, you know, to try and drive more coordination regionally with the nature-based solutions and the engineered solutions. Another thing that these governments can do is create a demand signal for CCU products by buying them prioritizing them. So uh, carbon capture and utilized fuels and carbon capture and utilized aggregates and concretes would be probably on the top of our list. Fuels, of course, are not suitable for the offset market, 
the concretes and aggregates are, but either way to help stimulate the circular carbon economy and start to create long-term carbon storage that we're gonna need. So as we close, we will be producing the final report soon. We will be releasing that on December 2nd, along with the webinar recording from today, the slides, and then also the maps, which will be hosted on our website for the global, at the Global CO2 Initiative, and also at the Conference of Great Lakes St. Lawrence Governors and Premiers. So you can play with those and turn on your own layers for where are the emissions? You know, what's the geologic storage? Where are the pipelines? We can move this stuff around. And I do apologize in advance for the length of the report. It's 80 plus pages, but there is an executive summary that's about 12 with lots of graphics that summarizes the uh, the material that you saw today from, from our team. I wanna thank you for your time this morning and joining us.